Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Humanities Forum. I'm not talking to you today, but I will begin. I have the mic right now. So I'll begin with a question, namely, why are you here? Now, there are pragmatic reasons, right? You're here because you're taking a class, you have extra credit, you want to graduate with a degree, you want a job in business. But there's something more, I think. There's a greater possibility, whether you all feel it or not, that's that you want to come to a better understanding of who you are, of what you believe, of how the world works. And how do you do that? You do that by asking questions, right? And including questions about the sorts of things we took for granted. So hold on to that thought. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. But that's what we shoot for with the Humanities Forum, which brings together members of the Providence College community to engage regularly in intellectual life outside of class, to deepen their appreciation for the humanities, to explore diverse perspectives from on and off campus. This particular forum is part of the Frederick Douglass Project, which is an initiative of the humanities program made possible by generous funding from the Jack Miller Center. It's based on the idea that a free society needs citizens who can think and speak clearly and argue persuasively. So we aim to do that by hosting events, teaching classes, organizing contests and debates. Now, a minute ago, I mentioned how you gain insight by asking questions about the things you once took for granted. And that's why I'm particularly excited to introduce to you today our guest, Professor Eric Nelson, who's a prof the Robert M. Barron Professor of Government at Harvard University. Professor Nelson's research focuses on the history of political thought in early modern Europe and America, and how that history still shapes debates in our world today. And he's viewed as one of the preeminent political theorists doing business today, in part because he calls into question the big assumptions you thought you knew. For instance, 1776, it's the colonists versus the king, right? Democracy versus monarchy. But in the Royalist Revolution, Professor Nelson's 2014 book, he shows how actually many of the founders were opposed to the parliament and kind of wanted to see a strong kingly executive in the US founding. So it called into question what we thought we knew about our relation between monarchy and the founding. His most recent book, The Theology of Liberalism, Political Philosophy and the Justice of God, likewise rewrites what you thought you knew about modern liberalism as a secular project, that is, as you know, purely enlightenment, rational project with no theological convictions. And today he's going to be challenging us to take a closer look at democracy, where, you know, the form of government we've all grown up with thinking is the, the natural, best, only good form out there. He's going to show it to us in a new light. So I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that Professor Nelson received his PhD from Cambridge University in England, his BA from Harvard, and he's won many awards and accolades over his years teaching at Harvard. And I should add finally that after this talk, at the, or at the end of Professor Nelson's talk, there will be about 20 minutes for Q&A with students getting top priority in asking questions, and that immediately following there will be a reception next door in the great room and I was about to say, out of respect for your fellow guests, make sure to put away your technology, but I don't actually see any technology out. So good work, everybody. With that, I give you Professor Nelson. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ian, and uh, thank you to the uh, Frederick Douglass program uh, for, uh, for hosting me, and uh, thanks to, uh, to all of you for, uh, uh, for, for coming along. Um, I, uh, I, I've been instructed to, uh, uh, to speak for no more than 35 minutes, and I'm going to keep to that, uh, and, uh, and then uh, hope to leave um, uh, lots of time for, uh, for discussion. So I'm going to take you in a, in a very um, cursory way uh, through a puzzle, and then uh, my attempt uh, to uh, at least um, contribute to a solution to the puzzle. Um, so the puzzle is pretty simple. Uh, it has to do with the history of the concept of democracy. Uh, and uh, the question is, um, how did the, uh, the, the term democracy undergo such an enormous transformation uh, over the course of uh, Western intellectual history? So many of you will know for most of uh, the history of the West, um, democracy uh, was a pejorative term. It was, uh, it was uh, the name of a corrupt constitution, a degenerate constitution, 
uh, you would not say, hello, my name is Bob, I'm a Democrat, right? You, you're, you called it, your enemy was a Democrat. You, you didn't call yourself that. Um, so its valence uh, was overwhelmingly negative. Uh, and uh, not just that, but its, uh, its meaning uh, was enormously different. Uh, that is, what it was taken to denote uh, was enormously different from what we've come to understand by the term, particularly as we apply it to, say, uh, the government under which we live uh, and similar governments around the world. So democracy uh, was associated in uh, antiquity, but through uh, the medieval and early modern periods, uh, with... Uh, several essential uh, kind of institutional devices. The first and most uh, famous probably is uh, citizen voting in the assembly, right? uh, the idea that uh, matters of public concern are decided by the citizens, even if the, the, citizen, uh, the citizenry is very restricted along lines of gender and other things. Uh, but nonetheless, all citizens vote in the assembly, uh, and uh, their magistrates are selected by lot. Uh, by, uh, uh, you know, sortition. Uh, and, uh, of course, um, we don't do that. I mean, we use the lot for juries, uh, but that's about it. Um, so here we have the puzzle, um, uh, and it's two uh, dimensions. The first is, how did this term with an incredibly negative valence, the name of a corrupt constitution, come to have not just a very positive valence, but ultimately uh, to be the term by which we designate what many people regard as the only legitimate constitutional form. That's an enormous distance for one word to travel, right? Uh, but also, how did its meaning transform uh, so that we can use the term democracy uh, to refer to what we've got, roughly speaking, which is a system in which the people don't vote on, uh, on legislative matters for the most part, but instead uh, we're governed by magistrates whom we choose in mass suffrage elections but not through the law. Uh, in the ancient world, the medieval world, election was regarded as an aristocratic device, right? not a democratic one. Why? Well, because uh, who wins elections? Uh, those who are well known, those from established families, those who are wealthy and so on. So it was taken to be an aristocratic or indeed an oligarchic device. So uh, that's the puzzle. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to suggest a partial solution to the puzzle. Um, uh, and uh, not to give the game away, but uh, if you've read my title, you'll be able to guess. I think it has something to do, rather surprisingly perhaps, uh, with the European uh, discovery and reception of uh, a, a Jewish Greek writer of the first century uh, called Philo of Alexandria. Um, but before I get into uh, the actual argument, I just want to take you through, um, as it were, the before, uh, before I give you the after. Um, so uh, I don't want to deny for a moment uh, the, the real teeth of the puzzle uh, that I just uh, outlined for you. Um, the antipathy to democracy in, uh, in the ancient world in particular um, is overwhelming. Uh, of course, um, there are sources that survive from democratic Athens, um, uh, orations, uh, most famously probably the, the, uh, the, the, the great oration of Pericles in Book Two of Thucydides' History, uh, but also orations by people like Demosthenes, praising democracy. But the overwhelming inheritance, whether we're talking about drama, uh, ancient tragedy, comedy, uh, and certainly the ancient philosophical tradition is overwhelmingly hostile. Um, uh, so, for Aristotle, of course, um, uh, and he, here he's just uh, sort of inheriting and then elaborating um, a crucial axiom that he takes from his, his teacher Plato, um, we get the famous threefold typology of constitutions, right? You can have the rule of one, the few, or the many. Those are the three essential types. And then each one comes in a correct or virtuous and a degenerate form. So, the rule of one in its proper form is monarchy, the rule of the few is aristocracy, the rule of the many in its proper form, uh, he calls, in order to be maximally confusing for all of history, politeia, uh, which, mean, which is the generic term also for constitution, uh, but is something like shared rule among a very restricted citizenry of virtuous men. 
Uh, and then on the other side, we've got the three bad ones, right? Tyranny, oligarchy, democracy. Right? Democracy is the name of the degenerate form of the rule of the many. Right? Uh, so uh, the, uh, th that's the view, and it is uh, really unchallenged for a very long time in the ancient philosophical tradition. So is the basic understanding of what this thing they don't like is. Right? So first of all, they know they don't like it, but they also agree on what it is they don't like. Uh, th th that is, this is a form of government characterized by the basic institutions I just mentioned to you. So already uh, by the middle of the fifth century, this is axiomatic. This is, uh, so just to give you an example, uh, kind of very well-known one, this is the historian Herodotus writing in book three of his histories where he has this fanciful debate uh, among various Persians about the best constitution and um, uh, the figure Otanes, uh, who argues for democracy, says uh, the rule of the demos, that is democracy, determines offices by lot, holds power accountable, that is, uh, he's using the term that means that each magistrate at the end of uh, the term of office would have an accounting, a kind of audit, uh, an euthune, as the Athenians call it, to uh, determine uh, that he had behaved himself, and conducts all deliberating publicly. Right. So it's public deliberation, uh, the right of everyone to debate public matters, uh, the, which uh, goes by the Greek term isegoria, uh, and, uh, and citizen voting along with selection by law. That's what democracy is, no question about it. And it's bad. <laughs> so uh, that's where we start. Um, the first shift really comes um, when uh, Greeks begin to write about Rome. Uh, so uh, in, uh, in really the sort of third and second centuries BC, and the major figure who, uh, who puts the first dent, it's a small dent, but it's still an important dent in this established view is um, the Greek historian Polybius, uh, who uh, writes this very, uh, very important uh, history of Rome in which uh, in book six, he gives an analysis of the Roman constitution uh, and here, um, he tweaks the Aristotelian typology. He says, actually, the, it, the uh, democracy is not the name of the corrupt form of the rule of the many uh, to be contrasted with political or constitutional government, as Aristotle had, uh, had put the case. But rather, democracy is actually the good version of the rule of the many. Uh, and its, op, its sort of antonym is what he called, it's a horrible word, achlocracy, which in Greek means the rule of the mob, right? So mob rule. Uh, and Polybius says, uh, in a community where it is traditional and customary to reverence the gods, to honor our parents, to respect our elders, and to obey the laws, and the will of the greater number prevails, this is to be called a democracy. Um, and this, he says, is... Uh, the correct version of the rule of the many, not the degenerate version. So are we in the presence already, this could be a very short lecture, uh, of the, the rehabilitation of democracy? Uh, no, because Polybius says, yeah, um, democracy is the name of the correct version of the rule of the many, but you still shouldn't want it, right? At least you shouldn't want it alone. Uh, because Polybius' argument is what you want is a mixed constitution uh, made up of um, elements of the three regime types, the rule of one, the rule of few, the rule of the many. So there should be a democratic element in the constitution, um, but you don't want an actual democracy. Still less do you want mob rule, but uh, this is not an argument for, um, uh, for democratic government. Uh, it is, however, beginning to chip away, as I said, at this idea of democracy as a pejorative. But notice what is not being chipped away at is what democracy is. Polybius is very clear, uh, citizen participation in the assembly uh, and election of magistrates by law. And you want to have some element of this uh, as part of an overall mixed regime. So even Polybius um, doesn't get us uh, where we need to go. Uh, and um, one uh, consequence of this is that it's been argued for a very long time that the rehabilitation of democracy um, has to be a modern phenomenon uh, because really there are no ancient authors um, who are of help. Uh, and so it had to be a kind of putting aside of the ancient tradition, uh, the ancient philosophical tradition, in order to get us uh, to something like uh, the, the picture we've inherited. Um, but I don't think that's true. Uh, and uh, here I'll introduce you to Philo. Uh, so Philo 
um, is, as I say, is an Alexandrian Jew. Um, we don't really know his exact dates. We know he's probably uh, born around the year 20 BC, dies probably about the year 50. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, um, rough contemporary of, of Jesus. Um, and he's writing in, uh, in Alexandria, and he is uh, a Platonist um, uh, of an idiosyncratic kind, but he, he's a product of the uh, Platonic school, and his claim to fame is that he's trying to put these bits of, in, of his background uh, into a coherent whole, that is, his Platonism and his Judaism. Uh, and he's trying to explain Jewish theology and Jewish scripture uh, in a way that harmonizes them with elements of Greek philosophy. Uh, it's a very complicated project, and he writes an enormous amount, and very unusually for ancient authors, a huge amount of it survives uh, because it was, um, uh, it was kept uh, and uh, regarded as of interest in the Alexandrian Christian community. Uh, and uh, for various reasons that I won't get into now, uh, and then uh, survives so that it can be circulated later. He wrote uh, something, over 70 texts uh, of Philo's uh, survives. But the key uh, fact is that in a number of these texts, you find Philo uh, following Polybius, whom he's read, and distinguishing between mob rule and democracy, just as Polybius has, but going much further and saying, actually, democracy is the name of the best constitution. So in an essay of his on agriculture, um, uh, he, uh, he says democracy, uh, to be distinguished from mob rule, is the best form of all. And in uh, an essay on the virtues, he writes that one should forsake, as it were, that very worst of all evil constitutions, the sovereignty of the mob, aklokratia, and adopt that best of all constitutions, a well-ordered democracy. So um, something strange. Uh, seems to be happening, uh, because first of all, we have this praise of democracy, but we have it from an unusual source, namely a Platonist. Platonists are, to say the least, not known for their great love of democracy. So uh, remember, it's the democracy that puts Socrates to death. So what is going on here? Well, the answer uh, is found in, um, in a very lengthy text that Philo writes uh, on the Decalogue, uh, on the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, and he then writes a supplementary text called The Special Laws, in which, uh, I mean, the, ar the argument is not uh, very important, but the basic structure of it is, uh, is an argument that all of the other commandments that appear in the Hebrew Bible can be understood to fall under the heading of one of the ten uh, commandments in the Decalogue. That's to say, it's, it's, he's arguing that you should think of the ten commandments, each one of them, uh, as a kind of, um, genus or heading under which there are uh, any number of, of sub-commandments. Uh, and it's a, it's a kind of labored argument, and he, he goes on for a very long time. But when he gets to book four, uh, he gets to uh, a question that he puts himself. He says, okay, so I've been talking about the Ten Commandments, um, but is there a sense in which you can regard them as a unity, not just as ten separate commandments that then issue out in these hundreds and hundreds of smaller commandments, but, uh, but as some kind of unity. How would that work? And he says, yes, they are, because they jointly teach the virtues. And in particular, uh, they teach the virtue of justice. So this then leads him on an excursus. What is justice? And he pivots um, in the course of that discussion to an analysis of the Mosaic Constitution form of government that he sees uh, uh, in the Hebrew Bible itself. And what he argues uh, is that the justice of, uh, of the Mosaic Constitution consists substantially in the way that it chose its rulers. And here's what he says. He says, some persons have contended that all magistracies ought to have the officers appointed to them by lot which, however, is a mode of proceeding not advantageous for the multitude. For the casting of lots shows good fortune, but not virtue. Why would we entrust the choice of the masters and rulers of entire cities and nations to such an arbitrary device? Surely, as he says, the casting of lots can have no connection with the ability to attend upon the sick, for physicians do not obtain their employments by lot, but because their experience is approved of. 
Or again, with reference to the successful voyage and safety of men at sea, it is not any man who may obtain the office of pilot by lot, but that person that has the charge given to him who, from his earliest youth, appears to have learnt and carefully studied the business of a pilot. So the government of cities should likewise be entrusted to those expert in such matters, not dispensed according to what he calls the blunder of fortune. Now, that should sound very familiar to at least some of you because that's pure Plato, right? And using exactly the same analogies that Plato uses. The ruler is like the ship's captain, uh, like the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the physician of souls, right? Um, uh, so, um, uh, again, very, very platonic, but again, that argument doesn't usually come, for a, come in for a landing on an endorsement of democracy, but rather the, the reverse. It says, that, well, that's why you don't want democracy. What is democracy? It's the selection of magistrates by law. You want the rule of experts. But that's not what Philo says. Instead, he looks at Israel, and he says, the all-wise Moses, seeing this by the power of his own soul, makes no mention of any authority being assigned by lot, but determines to institute appointment by election. Um, and it uses the term keratonetas, which means literally raising your hand. Therefore, he says, thou shalt not appoint a stranger to be a ruler over thee, but one of thine own brethren, quoting Deuteronomy 17, implying that the appointment is to be a voluntary choice and an irreproachable selection of a ruler whom the whole multitude with one accord shall choose, and God himself will add his vote in favor of and set his seal to ratify such election, that being who is the confirmer of all advantageous things, looking upon the man so chosen as the flower of his race, just as sight is the best thing in the body. Right. Okay. So the people as a whole uh, in the Mosaic Constitution, Philo argues, uh, of one accord, they jointly choose magistrates and they choose the ones who are most virtuous. Uh, and this is a sort of necessary outcome, Philo wants to suggest, of a proper election procedure where virtue will shine out. Right? Uh, it will be the factor that distinguishes uh, one person from another. And so uh, God himself, in a way, uh, ratifies the choice. Uh, and that's what the Israelites had. Now. It's very interesting, uh, for Philo, this um, continues to be the case even after the transition to monarchy. Right. So he says, even the kings uh, were chosen uh, in this way, uh, and he argues that uh, whenever choosing magistrates, uh, the will of the people is unerring, they will always choose uh, the most virtuous, um, and so on. So already he's, uh, he's identifying this kind of platonic meritocracy uh, in ancient Israel and arguing that it takes place by election. But then he gives you the punchline. Uh, he says, this is a constitution uh, that uh, embodies the principle of justice because the model or the, the mother principle of, uh, of justice is equality the principle of equality, what he calls the mother of justice itself. He says, equality is the most important good thing belonging to justice, which even if one were to pass over and be silent about all its other parts, would be an all-sufficient hymn of praise to it. It is equality which by its unchangeable laws and ordinances has arranged in their present beautiful order all the things in heaven and earth. All the things which are inharmonious or irregular amongst us are caused by inequality. And, those are, and all those which we have, that would have in them that regularity which becomes them are the work of equality, which in the universal essence of the universe one may fairly call the cosmos. In cities, one may entitle it that best and most excellent of all constitutions, democracy, in bodies, health, and in souls, virtue. So that's the remarkable kind of kaboom. Uh, at the end of the argument. He's saying, okay, what I've just described in Israel, this constitution in which the virtuous are selected as magistrates through election, no use of the lot, no use of the assembly, uh, the citizens are not voting on laws, uh, 
what we have is the rule of the best magistrates selected according to virtue. This is the government that respects equality. Why? Because it gives equal consideration for their virtues to each person. Uh, and the result is to be called democracy. Um, it was a very striking argument. Uh, and um, what I want to suggest is that um, really through serendipity, uh, this uh, particular uh, sort of riff that Philo gives you, associating democracy with this kind of virtuous elected rule, and also, crucially, uh, legitimating it by identifying Israel as a democracy, right? ancient Israel as a democracy, manages to survive and be reintroduced uh, into the West. Now, why is that surprising? After all, I just told you that Philo survived. Uh, lots of classical authors did. Um, but here, I need to introduce, in a way, uh, a third element to my puzzle. Because my, my puzzle, remember, had two prongs. Democracy, the valence of the term, positive to ne uh, negative to positive, and the meaning of the term, right? the ancient one to this very different one. But we can add, really, a third one, which is just the term democracy, the actual Greek term. Uh, how do we end up using it? Why do we end up using this Greek term? Well, why is that a puzzle? It's a puzzle because in good Latin, you did not use this term. Uh, because good Latin, by which I mean humanist Latin, right? So uh, Aristotle uh, and the other ancient authors, uh, many of them, of course, not Plato, is introduced later, but certainly Aristotle is introduced in the 13th century, reintroduced, translated into Latin for the first time by the scholastics, and their practice was this hyper-literal translation. And when they came ac uh, across a Greek technical term, like politeia, they didn't translate it. They just transliterated it. They just wrote politia in Latin letters. Uh, Democratia, they would just write Democratia. Right? Um, when the humanists come along, they regard this as barbarism. Right? Um, you should not use these foreign um, technical uh, sort of monstrous terms in good, uh, uh, good written Latin. Uh, you need to come up with a substitute. So here is uh, Aristotle's first humanist translator, Leonardo Bruni, uh, writing in 1424, it is certainly a very ignorant thing to leave words in Greek when we have perfectly good Latin equivalents. Why obtrude in a thousand places the word democratia and oligarchia and aristocratia and offend the ears of your readers? Right. So you should translate into good Latin. You should use some kind of substitute term that Cicero himself would have used, and that's what they all do. So the term democracy disappears, and you get Latin terms like popular state, popular administration, popular republic, any number of different sort of locutions, but you don't actually get the Greek term. And one of the extraordinary things, um, uh, it's a longer story, which I'm uh, uh, mercifully for you going to abbreviate, but uh, Philo, um, gets a very interesting treatment because this text, this crucial text of Philo, um, is introduced into the Latin West quite late, not until the middle of the 16th century is it translated into Latin. Uh, and it's translated into Latin uh, by actually the last Catholic master of Trinity College, Cambridge, in 1553, John Christopherson, who regards himself as a very good Ciceronian, but nonetheless does something very remarkable. Uh, and that is when he translates this text, uh, and again, to be very confusing to future scholars, he doesn't call it the special laws. He just takes that final section on justice uh, at the end of book four that I was mentioning, se separates it out, as many of the medieval scribes do, and calls it its own text on the creation of rulers or on, uh, on uh, the institution of princes. Uh, and there, he allows... Uh, he allows Philo to come across uh, perfectly accurately. He says, uh, when equality is honored in urbibus, that is in cities, the result is democratia, uh, which is conditioned by the best laws and is the most outstanding, praestantissima, of all the forms of the republic. Uh, and uh, so he not only allows this praise of democracy, which, by the way, when Philo was translated, as he had been before this, into some vernacular languages, mostly uh, French, uh, the translators didn't know what to do with this passage, and so they just translated their way out of it. Uh, they just replaced the term democracy with the word republic, uh, which 
uh, is, of course, <laughs> exactly its antonym uh, in, in the classical uh, context. Uh, and uh, Christopherson's version gets picked up. It becomes part of the standard Latin version. Uh, and then uh, it is read uh, by um, uh, those who don't have access to the original Greek uh, or have very imperfect Greek. Uh, and, uh, and becomes uh, part of the currency. And here's where um, I will uh, give you uh, the sort of the final chapter that I'm going to talk about here, and that is uh, that one of Philo's readers, uh, and we know this perfectly clearly, uh, who takes this argument directly from Philo, and this use of the word democracy from Philo is also the first theorist in the European tradition uh, to describe democracy uh, as the best form of government, and that is uh, the English uh, writer James Harrington, uh, who does this first in 1656 um, uh, during the, uh, the Cromwellian Protectorate in England uh, in his uh, most famous work, Oceana, uh, but he really uh, shows his cards in a work that he publishes two years later called The Prerogative of Popular Government. Uh, and the reason uh, that we can see Philo's fingerprints so clearly, not only the fact that, he, that Harrington mentions him directly, um, is that Harrington is also a Platonist. So Harrington, uh, it's again very striking, and it has struck scholars as very strange that Harrington describes the constitution he's proposing as a democracy. Uh, because what's it like? Well, he says in this constitution, uh, as he puts it, um, uh, what we want is to be governed by a natural aristocracy diffused by God through the whole body of mankind. The, the people have not only a natural but a positive obligation to make use of as their guides. So very, very platonic, right? There's a, a natural virtuous elite, uh, and we should be ruled by them. Uh, how are we going to be ruled by them? Well, we're going to choose them in elections. Why? Well, because if we live in the right kind of state, and then he's going to go on and talk about what that means, uh, then in elections, it's naturally the most virtuous who will rise to the top. That's how we'll have virtuous rule. Uh, so again, this is a very idiosyncratic, very eccentric understanding of what democracy is, and people haven't quite known what to say about it. Uh, but of course, I think we do know what to say about it. It's just Philo's uh, understanding. Um, and uh, and uh, Harrington tells us this directly. Um, if we look, again, it gets more complicated because he doesn't refer to the text as the special laws. None of them does. He refers to it as this separate text uh, called On the Creation of Rulers. And he says that Moses introduced election by, for magistrates, that is in, in Israel, is expressly said by Philo uh, in his text uh, De Institutione Principum, On the Institution of Rulers. Uh, and to make his case, he goes on to say, the most wise, uh, Moses never intended, so he's just quoting Philo, that the royal dignity should be acquired by lot, but chose rather uh, that magistrates should be elected by chirotenia, just using um, Philo's Greek term, or the suffrage of the whole people, the, the congregations of the people assembled upon this as upon other public affairs uh, required a sign or confirmation from God just quoting Philo, for as much as by his will man is to the rest of nature as the face is unto the body. So just quoting that passage uh, directly. Um, so there's much more to say uh, about all this, but uh, I'm coming in on my 35th minute. So uh, uh, are, are you sure? oh, I'm, I can, uh, well, so then I'll just say um, a little bit about um, uh, where Harrington tweaks because it's very interesting and, and extremely important for the next chapter of the story. Uh, Harrington takes the Philonic account, but there are a couple of things he doesn't like. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, that Philo has no role at all uh, in his Constitution of Israel for legislation. Um, for, from Philo's point of view, and he's just uh, taking seriously the famous statement in, De in, De in Deuteronomy that this is the law and you shall not add or subtract one iota from it. Right? Um, Philo concludes from that that in Israel there is no legislation. Right? The Bible is closed. You have the biblical law, that's it. Uh, you can't add, you can't subtract. Um, Harrington doesn't like that. He wants uh, there to be uh, 
a legislative aspect uh, in the Constitution that he's describing, and even in Israel. And so he's going to argue uh, that a popular assembly, uh, that the people in Israel had the right uh, to uh, um, ratify and repeal laws. Uh, and that's what the idea and understanding of the covenant is. So he introduces, uh, alongside the election of magistrates, some role uh, for, um, uh, for popular government, but he does it in a way uh, that, again, would have horrified earlier democratic writers. Because what Harrington uh, argues is that there should be not the people as a whole. We don't have plebiscites in Harrington. We don't have referenda. We have a popular assembly that's elected by the people, uh, a higher assembly or a senate that's made up of the natural aristocrats. They get to formulate the laws, deliberate, argue, and propose. And the people just say yes or no. And they have to do it in complete silence. That's the key point for Harrington. Uh, that um, the motion is put before the people, there is no debate, there's no discussion, and then they just ask for the ayes and nays. Uh, so for an ancient Democrat, of course, this is the nightmare. I mean, this is, uh, first of all, it's not the people as a whole, it's an assembly uh, that's elected. Second of all, uh, there's no uh, right for citizen debate, uh, public debate, just the mere prerogative of resolving. Uh, and yet Harrington calls this democracy uh, and argues that it's the best form of government. So he is the first uh, to, uh, to make this move. Uh, and then it's a very clear matter uh, to trace the lineage from Harrington uh, to other people you will have heard of, Spinoza, uh, uh, the, the next big one. Uh, and, uh, and we are then well launched on the very um, sort of surprising modern career uh, of the term democracy, uh, where uh, it, uh, it, it both means something very different than what it used to mean, uh, and uh, its valence is very different indeed from what it used to be. So I'll just stop there, and then we can have questions. Make sure, th make sure that I bring the microphone to you um, before you start speaking so that your words will be captured. Questions for Professor Nelson, who would like to go first. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I apologize if I don't uh, word this properly, but uh, you had, you'd mentioned something earlier about um, the notion of democracy, uh, at least uh, selection by lot being something that was for uh, the aristocrats, you know, something that was determined more by popularity uh, and, you know, luck than uh, by... Yeah, right. yeah, in yeah, elections. Yeah, yeah than yeah. by uh, actual virtue or by, you know, right. being the best for the position. Yes. Would you say that, um, you know, even today when we're, where we have popular election, uh, you know, for like Senate, House of Representatives, not the presidency, um, that it's... Uh, you, know, you still see that where like the people who are winning elections more often than not have family ties or connections uh, and may not be the most qualified? Well, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, and I, I don't want to uh, pretend to be a political scientist, um, but the data is actually quite overwhelming on this point that in, uh, in democracies, um, uh, people who come from prominent families uh, and people who are very wealthy uh, have enormous electoral advantages. Uh, and uh, if you look, for instance, at uh, the U.S. Senate, um, you know, the poorest member is still a millionaire. Uh, uh, at least, I think Joe Biden was the poorest member for a while. But, um, but anyway, uh, so um, it's certainly true uh, that uh, that being a prominent person, being from a well-known background, um, uh, and uh, and having money has historically uh, given you a leg up in elections. Um, so it's not a it doesn't seem to me a silly view uh, that they held. But I just want to add that someone um, like Aristotle would say, look. Um, uh, you might have, you could imagine a good uh, sort of scenario in which the people who are elected are the ones who are the most virtuous, right? And that's why he distinguishes between what he calls oligarchy, 
and aristocracy. So both are versions of the rule of the few. But aristocracy literally means the rule of the best men, the aristoi. Uh, and Aristotle thinks this is a very good form of government. And he thinks that you can get this through elections. So it's not that you're doomed. Um, the question is, what do you have to do in order to make sure that you're going to, that the result of elections will be uh, the selection of the most virtuous um, citizens as magistrates rather than, let's say, the wealthiest. Uh, and uh, his answer, uh, like Harrington's answer, is to say you have to make sure that people can't become fabulously rich. Right? So that there, are, there are enormous limits in these theories, uh, you know, coming as they do from the Platonic tradition, very stringent limits on what people can accumulate. Because the idea is you have to prevent uh, wealth and poverty, great wealth. You know, uh, you don't, pr perhaps you don't need strict equality. There's, there's kind of internal debates about this. But you, but you have to keep wealth and poverty in bounds uh, because if, uh, if people become fabulously wealthy, if they become uh, notable on the grounds of their wealth, then wealth will replace virtue as the criterion according to which political authority is distributed. Um, uh, and that's a very orthodox view uh, in, uh, in sort of European political thought. The first person who really turns it on its head is Tocqueville. Um, much, much, I mean, but, but then we're in the middle of the 19th century. So this Harringtonian idea, um, which is a very Platonic Aristotelian idea, um, is, uh, is very dominant for, uh, you know, a couple, couple centuries. So, um, yeah, but it's a great question. Yeah, thanks um, for that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, and maybe you said and I missed it, but Philo, right, there's, there's two ways to read the Jewish scriptures as far as politics. I mean, there's probably more, but there's at least two. A lot more, yeah. Especially right. when it comes to monarchy, right? Big fat mistake starts as a mistake, ends as a mistake. The other is a more positive one. You can sort of find that in the First and Second Chronicles where David becomes a model and that kind of thing. He's sort of a model in the first one, but not really. It's a little bit different. So, I mean, what you had in, in the scriptures is primarily the political system is monarchy, if you, you know, just the Jewish scriptures. So what did Philo do? How did uh, he interpret Well, it's that? a great question. So as, as I said, Philo, um, and this is also something that Harrington dissents on from Philo. It's something that he challenges him on. Um, Philo thinks that Israel is a democracy through the entire uh, sort of biblical period, including the period of the kings. So he doesn't see, for Philo, he's, ex he's explicit, there's no incompatibility between monarchy and democracy. Uh, so it's still a democracy uh, when you have Saul and David, he thinks, because they've been chosen, and they've been chosen on the basis of their virtues. Now, he does, however, and it's very interesting, um, fact about his argument, and perhaps it reflects his sort of Roman um, uh, uh, context, he doesn't actually use the word king uh, in relation to Saul and David uh, and the others. Uh, he calls them archons, um, using the, the sort of term for chief, you know, Greek chief magistrate in a city. Uh, and Harrington happens to pick this up too. He calls his, you know, uh, the, the, the main, the sort of chief magistrate of Oceana, Lord Archon. Right. Um, so uh, there is, there does seem to be an antipathy to the word uh, king, um, and that may reflect, um, as I said, uh, broader currents that 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 are that are going on. But um, he doesn't regard this in the way that, say, Josephus does, and many subsequent uh, people will, uh, as a great rupture. Right, the kind of the sin of uh, you know either. Uh, either a great good rupture or a great bad rupture, and you know their both views are are present. Um, he tries to to treat this as a continuum. Um, as I say, that could reflect the attitude of the Romans, um, in that um, uh, there. So there's a, there's more context here, and I don't, don't want to uh, sort of um, uh, get into the weeds. But uh, one of the other uses 
of the term democratia that um, uh, evolves in the Roman period amongst the Greeks who write, uh, who are using the term, uh, which for interesting reasons was unavailable in the Latin West because of the strange translation history of the relevant texts, you did, we know that you had ancient um, uh, is it Greek writers writing in the first century uh, in Rome in this moment of transition from what we call the Republic to the, the Principate, um, and using the word demokratia to translate the term republic. So talking about the Roman demokratia uh, as their best translation for the republic, and the Roman writers uh, do not recognize, uh, I mean, the, you know, our, we, we're very used to talking about the Roman Republic as opposed to the, the Principate or the Republic as opposed to the Empire, but that's a Renaissance usage. Um, the Romans talk about Res Publica Romana before, during Augustus, and after. Um, and so this may reflect that. Um, however, Harrington doesn't like it. And Harrington wants to say Israel was only a democracy until uh, it fell by, uh, by, uh, by selecting a king. Uh, so he, uh, he, he rejects Philo's sort of harmony. Right, right, right. Uh, so 1 Samuel 8 is the end of the democracy. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, well, it doesn't say anything about democracy, but it... Yeah. Well, of course, there's a huge debate about how to read that speech. So some... Uh, you know, uh, so there's, a, there's the view that says this is just a speech designed to scare the Israelites. Uh, it's a kind of prophecy of what bad kings are going to do. Uh, and then there's the view that says, no, it's actually setting out the prerogatives of monarchy. So there, as you say, th th that's a whole other can of worms. But Philo, do Philo doesn't, uh, doesn't get into it. Yeah. yeah. Hi, thank you. Hi. I think I heard you say at one point that democracy and republic are opposites. Could you say a little bit more about the exact difference between those two words? Uh, yeah, can I use this for a second? Sure. Okay. So um, basically, um, the, the, term, the semantics of the term republic, if I take this, okay, can you still hear me? Uh, semantics of the term republic are uh, incredibly complicated and a whole other story. So first of all, remember, we're talking about a Latin term, not a Greek term. So already the question, and this, is, this arises for Cicero, is what in Greek do you translate uh, as res publica? So remember, I was talking about Aristotle's. So you have monarchy, uh, tyranny, oligarchy, aristocracy. Uh, and then democracy, and this thing that Aristotle calls politeia. Uh, so Aristotle uses for the correct version of the rule of the many um, the name constitution. He just calls it constitution. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, for a long time, uh, you know, in the scholastic translations, this was just called politia because, as I said, they're just transliterating the terms. They're not translating. But when the humanists come along, when Leonardo Bruni comes along and does the first humanist translation of Aristotle, he says, well, we can't call this politia because that's just, that's barbarism. So we need a Latin term. Uh, what's the term? Uh, and then he will say res publica. So he'll translate this as res publica. Uh, and that's the beginning of that. So here it is the opposite of this, right? It's the, it's the good version of the rule of the many. This is the bad version of the rule of the many. And it excludes, on, I mean, the, the key revolutionary thing about that translation, um, as my colleague Jim Hankins has pointed out in some very important work, is that this for really, um, f for, the first, for the first important time, um, makes monarchy and republic incompatible, right? So the term res publica, as I was just saying, when the Romans use it, um, they have no problem talking about Rome under the emperors as a res publica, right? So the idea that republic means non-monarchical constitution um, is, uh, is 
something that's only floated in these Greek writers of the second century writing about Rome, whose texts uh, have a very strange translation history, or these humanists beginning in the 15th century. So for a long time, res publica isn't used at all in this typology, right? except to mean the state or something like that. Um, and then it's introduced as a way of translating politeia in its um, more specific sense, right? Not constitution in general, but the good version of the rule of the many. Um, so does that, does that help? Yeah, I guess why did they pick res publica? To translate politeia? Um, it was the best they had. Um, uh, you know, uh, Bruni was aware it's actually not a perfect translation uh, because politeia, um, you know, uh, some of you will know, is a very broad term in, in Greek. It means constitution, but not constitution like the Constitution of the United States, like a written constitution. It means in the, it, constitution in the sense that we still talk about people having, let's say, a strong constitution, right? It's, it's something like the, the ordering principle of something, um, and it can mean more broadly way of life, citizenship, uh, you know. Um, and res publica really means something like the state. Um, but, uh, but Bruni felt that was the best he could do, and it turned out to be a sort of momentous decision uh, because you eventually get to the point, I mean, think of Machiavelli, the beginning of the prince, all states, all states are either principalities or republics. Right? Um, until that translation change, that, that sentence would have been absolutely unintelligible to European readers. I don't understand, what, what, you know, why can't it be a principality and a republic? Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a, but it's a very good question. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, first off, just wanted to thank you for being here. This was great. Oh. Um, and so I just wanted to get your take on a uh, trend, I guess, in our society that we've been seeing, especially in recent years, where we have sort of these like far fringe factions um, that for a long time we sort of thought were done in a way with sort of reasserting themselves and trying to work um, aside and outside our system um, that for a long time we've obviously had established here in our country and what that might mean um, specifically for our system in the future and exactly why um, these forces, both on the far right and far left, are sort of reasserting their heads. Gosh. Um, Sorry, that's sort of a loaded question. Well, it's 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 um, it's not loaded. It's just uh, it's just enormous. Um, and uh, and uh, and I have no special expertise on it. Uh, I mean, I think we're all trying to. I mean, almost in real time, uh, trying to think our way through these extraordinary um, and uh, to most of us, I think, very alarming um, uh, developments. Uh, and uh, you know, the other people who work in my building uh, who are empirical political scientists who study uh, Europe or um, uh, India or Turkey or um, uh, you know, fill in the blank. I mean, the extraordinary thing is, of course, this seems to be happening everywhere uh, in countries that are otherwise very, very different um, that's to say different not only in the obvious cultural dimensions, but in their economic performance, their levels of inflation, their level, I mean, you know, their, their, uh, their degree of, uh, of popular homogeneity. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything um, uh, that uh, all the countries drifting in, you know, in these sort of extreme directions have in common. Uh, it seems to be a sort of global pandemic. And we don't, um, uh, and I think we're all trying to, to come to grips with, um, with this fact. Uh, you know, um, one of the major explanations that, um, uh, that has always struck me as, uh, and I, I have no more authority than any of you, uh, but just as a reader, uh, it struck me as persuasive, more persuasive than most of the other explanations, um, is at least in many of these countries, the extraordinary um, division that's developed between urban and rural um, communities. That's to say, um, uh, we're sort of, uh, particularly you know, this country, but you could say exactly the same thing in the UK, in France, in Germany, uh, that basically you've had um, 
uh, you know, sort of the emptying of rural areas uh, and uh, sort of the people who are sort of upwardly mobile, but, uh, you know, sort of uh, wanting to get sort of university educations and so on, sort of flooding into the cities. Uh, and, um, and these become quite hermetically sealed off worlds. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, I mean, it, you know, it was, it was quite extraordinary in the, uh, not the last congressional election, which was a little weird, but the one before that, uh, that um, uh, essentially when you looked at the map, I mean, we talk about red and blue states um, here, but when you look at the map, you're really talking about urban and rural districts. And basically the cities all vote the same way and uh, the rural and the suburbs all vote the same way. Uh, and um, I mean, when I was growing up, uh, take uh, a, a, you know uh, an example that I have where I have no particular skin in the game, uh, Texas, right? Uh, it used to be that uh, you know Dallas and Houston would vote Republican, um, Austin, El Paso, San Antonio would vote Democratic, uh, and uh, and then you know and and, uh, and you had the you know now you know you're now at the point where all the cities. Uh, and all the suburbs um, of all these cities vote Democratic, and the 94 rural counties vote Republican. Uh, and so um, that's a very different way for a country to be divided, uh, and, uh, and it makes for a sort of cultural chasm uh, that I think perhaps we don't take sufficiently seriously. I mean, it's the stuff that people made fun of after the 2016 election that, um, you know, for instance, uh, things that were supposed to be very good predictors of voting behavior like education level, socioeconomic position were actually rather poor predictors of voting behavior, but things like do you watch Modern Family or Duck Dynasty were really good predictors of voting behavior. And um, uh, people thought that was funny. It's not funny. It's actually very, very alarming. Yeah. But that's just my two cents. Uh, I have no special, <laughs> no special status. <laughs> Hi, and uh, thank you again for being here. This was great, as he said. Um, one of the topics that we talked about in one of our seminars a few weeks ago had to deal with the wealth gap, as you mentioned, between um, the elitists and, and the very wealthy, and then um, the average Joe, as we called in our seminar, and then uh, the poor. And we were talking about how leadership and um, seats of power are affected by the, the gap, and we kind of had a little debate about how if we think um, the country or any types of governments would benefit from um, more people that relate to like the bigger crowd in the country, how the government and the, and the functionalities of the government would benefit from that um, based on history, Aristotle and, and many other philosophers that you mentioned. Um, I know you said that you're not a political scientist, but based on your expertise in history, do you think that that could be something that would be beneficial um, from having people that relate to a bigger crowd in the country, running the country, rather than these elitists and these very, very wealthy um, moguls that, that, that actually run and win. It's a, it's a phenomenally difficult question. Um, and, uh, you know, um, there are people nowadays who, um, uh, who are returning to, uh, I mean, of course, it doesn't follow from your uh, your premise. Uh, I mean, you could. There are lots of different ways you might try to broaden the, let's say, the governing class. Uh, you know, it's the the, the the sort of composition of the governing class. But uh, since we were talking about this kind of ancient distinction between a lock, uh, between elections and sortition, uh, the use of the lot, uh, there are a lot of people now who are arguing for you know citizen assemblies that that are uh, selected by lot, like juries, um, and uh, and sort of tasked with particular decisions. Um, the issue, of course, is that, um, well, there are any number of issues. Um, they're, they're kind of the, um, pra uh, the sort of um, pragmatic uh, issues about how well it would work and whether um, uh, uh, groups of that kind would make the kinds of decisions uh, that, uh, that you'd want them to make. Um, but you also have, and then, of course, what are the, the unintended consequences of that? So one of the uh, the, one of the kind of perennial worries uh, about uh, all of these devices uh, to make um, the governing classes more popular, let's say, less entrenched as a separate interest. Um, uh, you know, so for instance, in the, in the late 1990s, there was this fad for term limits, right? The idea was we don't want these professional politicians kind of going to Washington for 40 years. We want, 
you know, you want to be, we want you to be a doctor and then, you know, go for a term, you know, serve in the Senate and then come home. Uh, and, uh, and lots of states adopted term limits and lots of cities adopted term limits. Uh, and there, there, there have been very few robust findings in the literature on American political science in the last 20 years, but this is one of them. We know what happened when that happened, which is just a massive transfer of authority to the bureaucracy. Uh, because basically what that means is that no one knows what he or she is doing in office, uh, and the bureaucrats who are there, who stay there, right, end up um, capturing a great deal of power. So you worry about those kinds of problems, but you also worry about problems at the level of political theory, right? because at this point, democracy has come to mean something very different. Of course, it did, you know, in ancient democracy, um, you had these two dimensions, right, the, the people voting in the assembly, and choosing magistrates by lot. The thing about lot is th uh, that worries people who think of themselves as Democrats and are opposed to this, um, you know, this kind of initiative, is that it seems to take away our agency. Right? Um, what, what these people want is to say, no, we're choosing who rules us. Right? Um, but if you have a lot, you're not choosing. Right? You're just choosing to be governed by uh, you know, the first five names that come out of the hat. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, you might have a worry about sort of popular sovereignty um, uh, in such a system. It, it, it then is going to implicate really complicated questions in political theory and ideas about representation and authorization and consent and all, that, uh, all of that stuff. So um, it's a fabulous question. It's a really tough question right? because, you know, uh, I've just picked apart like two or three of the dimensions of it, but there are probably about 82. So, yeah. Hi. So first of all, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you for this very illuminating lecture. So unfortunately, I've never read Philo, uh, but I have read the Hebrew. Nobody's perfect. Okay. Right, right. I need to get on that. Um, but I have read the Hebrew Bible, and I have to say I'm really struggling with Philo's argument, at least as you're presenting it, that uh, the Hebrew Bible evinces any sort of support for democracy, either in its ancient version or in its modern version, because, well, for example, the, I mean, the first leader of the people of Israel post sinaitic revelation is Moses. He was chosen for that position by God. He experiences a big challenge to his authority from Korah, um, who is like the first demagogue, right? I mean, he literally says, why should Moses have all the power and prestige where all the people of Israel were all equal? And he experiences a rather ignominious end, right? He's sucked into the bowels of the earth. Uh, it seems like that's, <laughs> that's a, like a pretty big repudiation of the, the fundamental democratic idea that we're all equal um, and that we all should have a say. And so this idea that the Hebrew Bible is a small d democratic document. I'm I'm just having trouble understanding how that could be. Well, it's um, it's a fabulous question, and it's a totally fair question. Um, the uh, it, it's and, and I mean there are several ways into it. One is to say that Philo um, is uh, is drawing on uh, you know, a number of sources that we don't have any longer, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of traditions of biblical exegesis. And as you know, there are, um, uh, there are very many strands in the Hebrew Bible uh, when it comes to these questions of, uh, of rule and authority. Um, uh, so there's the, you know, so for instance, you know, someone on, the, on Philo's side would say, well, yes, I hear you, but uh, you know, we also, get this idea that what, what makes the covenant the covenant is the people say, we will do and observe it. Right? Um, that it's not a covenant until it's accepted. Right? Uh, and Harrington, of course, makes a ton of that right? to, to argue that this is actually, um, ultimately, it's the people who have to, who have to accept um, uh, the Constitution. Um, of course, the Talmud, I mean, you know, uh, has two very competing understandings of exactly this question, right, where one says, well, yes, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it, it's the people saying, you know, the, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will uh, undertake and observe the commandments, and they do this freely. And in the other, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Talmud imagines that God, when God asks them to accept the laws, he holds the mountain over them, right? 
And it says, you know, it's your, your choice. Um, so, uh, but that brings me to another very important point, and that is that Philo didn't know the Mishnah. Uh, and this produces problems later. So I didn't uh, want to get into the sort of small ball of it. But for instance, um, in a way, you, you could even deepen your critique uh, of Philo's reading uh, because where does Philo um, get off arguing that there is no lot used in the Hebrew Bible? Because you seem to have a very clear uh, example, um, which is the, uh, the, in Numbers, the selection of the 70 elders, the, the, the sort of Sanhedrin, because the idea is, okay, you're going you're gonna to draw them uh, from the different tribes, uh, and, uh, and in the Bible, it says that Moses is going to choose, uh, you know, whatever it is, six from each tribe, uh, but then you need to, you want to end up with 71 so that you can break a tie, which means someone has to be lotteried out, uh, and they run a lottery uh, to determine who gets lotteried out. Um, and, uh, and uh, th or rather, that's not spelled out in the Bible, but it is spelled out in the Mishnah, and Harrington knows this, not because he knows much Hebrew at all, as he freely admits, but because he's reading sources about the Talmud that have been translated into Latin. Uh, and, he, and so he's read this, and he knows there's this problem. So he then fudges and says, okay, well, the way to reconcile this is to say, in Israel, you, could, you, you had a... Pro he compares it to, very interestingly, very creatively, to um, Venice the way that Venice selects magistrates. He says it's, it's, it's like Venetian balloting, where it's a mix of the lot and election. That's to say, you use election to choose the final slate of names, and then you draw one out of the hat, right? And, and that's going to be the winner. And he says, it's like that. So Mos so in, when, in his reconstruction, he says, each of the tribes elects its six representatives, and then one of them by, by lot is removed. Uh, and that kind of lot is okay because it's still consistent with the kind of merit, mer meritocratic principle. Now, Harrington has to know that he's fudging because he's, you know, he has perfectly good access to the correct translation of that section of the Mishnah uh, and a discussion of it. So, um, uh, so there are all kinds of problems that these guys run into when they're trying to adapt the biblical materials in any way uh, for, uh, for contemporary polemical purposes. But the, but the legitimating power of saying this is endorsed in the Bible, this, is, you know, this was part of God's constitution, the one and only time he designed a constitution, was so enormous uh, that they all tried. Right? Uh, and, uh, and Philo was then a crucial authority, um, not least because, uh, and this gets to the question of why Philo survived, um, Philo um, actually had very limited reception um, in, you know, in the, in the uh, kind of first couple of centuries after his death, but by the time you get to kind of Clement of Alexandria and then that whole group, um, he becomes a kind of Christian hero uh, because, uh, first of all, um, he didn't deny Christ, um, you know, he, he, he was in the generation just, just before, uh, so he, he wasn't a sort of bad Jew, but also um, uh, he was seen in various texts uh, to endorse um, some version of monasticism, uh, and so uh, he became a kind of favorite of early monks and, and so on, and, and so they copied him a lot. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it's... Um, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's just a kind of crazy, serendipitous story, but yeah. Uh, I think it's still not on. Here you go. Okay. So, Dr. Bernhoft and I teach a class on persuasion, and in your initial account of Greek democracy, one of the institutions that you mentioned were really important to democracy as public deliberation or a culture of public deliberation. But then in the history that you trace of democracy, especially focusing on Polybius and Philo, it seems like you're very much focusing on institutions and 
uh, their definitions of, you know, how we go about choosing our leaders, um, appointment of magistrates. So I was wondering, uh, with, you know, with Polybius and, you know, especially with uh, Philo, whether they talk about democratic culture or a culture of public deliberation that needs to support, uh, you know, a democracy or those institutions that they deem democratic? Um, well, so as I said, um, uh, Polybius, the answer is yes, because Polybius, you know, uh, is still sticking to the traditional understanding of what a democracy is. And so that will involve, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, the, the idea of assembly voting, magistrate selection uh, by lot, and, uh, and what goes with assembly voting is isegoria, so the, the right of, of citizens to participate in public debate. Uh, and uh, you know the sort of famous invocation at the beginning of uh, of you know each session of the Athenian Assembly, who wishes to speak, right? Um, and uh, and it's that form of government that he thinks we should merge in this prudential way with elements of monarchy and uh, elements of aristocracy. So he's still working on the traditional understanding uh, from the classical world of what democracy is. Philo, it seems to me, is a very different picture because Philo is not talking about any of that. Um, he certainly doesn't talk about citizen uh, voting. Uh, the assembly piece drops out entirely, and because the assembly piece drops out, the Isegoria piece drops out. Um, now, you could ask, uh, and it's a very good question to ask, um, what does Philo think about how these elections take place? I mean, that's to say, do people speak on behalf of different candidates? Do they, you know, and the answer is he just doesn't say. Um, so, uh, so you get this tradition uh, that comes out of um, the Philonic uh, kind of story um, that is very lukewarm toward popular participation as part of democracy. I already mentioned Harrington. I mean, you know, Harrington um, has um, no room for popular um, deliberation at all. I mean, so citizens, the mass of the citizens don't do anything. They elect members of the lower house uh, the, the lower house itself doesn't deliberate, right? It simply votes up or down whatever measures um, the sort of the wise in the, you know, in the, uh, in the upper house um, uh, choose to, uh, to, uh, uh, to put forward. So there's deliberation in the upper house, kind of senatorial deliberation, uh, liber deliberation amongst these people that Harrington calls the natural aristocrats, um, but not popular deliberation. Uh, and so, uh, in a way, that's what I'm trying to kind of trace out, the way that you get kind of democracy without public popular deliberation and without sortition. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's in a way the thing that needs to be explained. Um, so, yeah, I hope that helps. I hope you all will join us next door for some um, beverages and food and stuff like that. And I hope you all will give Professor Nelson a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.